Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are tuning in around the world. We are so glad that you are with us for another edition of Stories and Myths. And I am here with the champion uh, who just won in the ring. Right? Isn't no. that what they do when they win in the ring? Actually, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, yeah, don't know. John C. Farrell. And how are you this evening, John C. Farrell? I am doing well. I'm doing wonderfully. I got a actually new chair here, so I'm sitting comfortable. So oh, very it's not exciting. as squeaky. It's not as squeaky as my last chair, so that's good. So that is, how are you that doing, is Greg? Good. I am doing well. You and I had the privilege on what day was it? Tuesday, right? Tuesday night. Uh, to do what? What did we do? That was a privileged uh, event. We got. We we're fortunate enough and to go see a pre-screening of Jennifer Hudson's Aretha Franklin biopic, biopic called Respect, which was, um, I, I thought was extremely well done. Um, I, I had very, very little complaints about it. It was, it was superb. The acting was great. The music, of course, it's Aretha. It's the queen of soul. Um, five stars all around for me. And your only complaint was... My only complaint was it was really long, but she had, I didn't realize all the turmoil and all the struggles that she had and with the internal demons that she had, I I, I was um, unaware of that. And so it was, um, it was an interesting look in, at her life and it was very, very well done. And kudos to Jennifer Hudson and to Marlon Wayans and to, Forrest Whitaker and everyone else who um, who played a part. I thought it was well done on all accounts. And Jennifer Hudson was handpicked by Aretha Franklin to play the role. I did not know that. That's awesome. Yeah, she, she saw, you know, Aretha saw Jennifer in Dream Girls mm -hmm. and said uh, that yeah. girl, that girl is the one to play me in the movie. Well, there, there's many times throughout the movie where you forget you forget that you're actually watching Jennifer Hudson and not the Queen herself, because she does such an unbelievable, unbelievably good job at portraying Aretha Franklin, and I, I can't say enough about it. It was very well done. Well, I agree, and uh, I will be writing the review this time. Normally, John C. Farrell is the one who writes most of the reviews on inspiration.org where he and I work together at our day job. But uh, this time John has been gracious or actually his plate is so full that he allowed a, a, a morsel to fall down so that we, the puppies at the foot could have one of those morsels. So I'm excited about that. I will be writing the review. It will be coming out next Tuesday on inspiration.org. Absolutely. And I'm interested. I'm excited to read it to kind of see your your internal thoughts on it, because I know you haven't told me everything that you I, I know that you liked it and everything. But to to see what what you put down on paper, I'm excited to read and look forward to that. Well, this is the story of uh, several generations of an African-American family who made mm -hmm. an impact on the world through uh, their music, and their church ministry. And uh, that is really interesting because that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Another multi-generation of African-Americans who made a tremendous impact on the world through their music and through their ministry. And that is the story of my book, Nobody Knows, the Harry T. Burley story. And so we want to talk tonight about this man, Harry T. Burley. And some people will say, well, who is that? I, right. I don't know who that is. Well, that's why we chose the name. Nobody knows. It was a, a dual reason. One reason was that it was about uh, someone that not a lot of people know about, but who has had a tremendous impact on not only American society, but on the world. And then also, of course, this, this wonderful spiritual, Nobody Knows, Go ahead, John. You want to you want to hum a few bars of Nobody Knows? Uh, do I know that? No. Nobody. Oh. Knows. Yeah, what movie is that from? The um, Trouble I See. There's a lady that sings it in a movie. Um, 
There's lots of people who sing it in movies. No, but the probably best known is uh, the bird in Lion King. Remember that? Yeah, but that's not what I'm thinking. <laughs> Could be a phone call. No, um, nobody knows. Well, it, it's all right. I, 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 it'll, it'll come to you. Yeah, it will come. Watch, it'll come to to me in the middle of one of your answers, and when I speak up to say say it, I'll forget it. So, all that's right, how well, everything you happens. might want to have a piece of paper to write these things down to capture them. Right. So, so what do we got first? So, well, first thing, like first of all, as as you said, nobody knows. Um, I, we were talking about Aretha Franklin. I and I knew very little about her. I did know a little bit about her. But this guy, Harry T. Burley, I know even less about. So um, your book's called Nobody Knows. And so um, outside of the obvious of nobody knows who Harry T. Burley is, why did you use that title? I find it an in intriguing title. Well, I just kind of told you. Uh, I'll right. say it but again. In any more uh, reasons. Yeah, and I'll give you some details on why I chose the subject as well. Okay. So um, nobody knows is one of the great, Negro spirituals. And nobody knows who wrote any of the spirituals. That was something that I didn't realize going into this project. I started working on this project in the late 1990s. A friend of our family did a one-man show about Harry T. Burley, and I was blown away. At the time, I was at uh, Regent University studying uh, journalism and divinity, and I needed to do my master's thesis and when I saw this one act show or one man show about Harry Burley, I said, that is a story that I would love to sink my teeth into. And so I started doing research on Burley. And, you know, like I said, I thought that Burley or other people wrote the spirituals, but the spirituals were uh, spontaneous songs that came uh, from, we believe, we don't know this for sure, but what has been passed down orally is that the spirituals came from religious services. So the slaves would either gather amongst themselves at a plantation or several different slaves from different plantations would go into the woods and they would have religious services where they cried out to God. And the uh, American slaves identified with the slaves of Egypt, the Jewish slaves in Egypt, the children of Israel. And so they were crying out for a Moses to be a deliverer. And they were crying out for God to set them free from their chains. And so in these spirituals, there are a lot of biblical references, a lot of biblical more uh, metaphors and allegory that are in these story songs. So they were a cry of prayer, but there were also spirituals that were um, songs that were there just to keep uh, their spirits up. And so there were work songs. And so you would hear them hit these rhythmic type of songs as they were working to help them keep going with this terribly tedious toil that they were forced to endure. Then there were other songs that were songs with messages in them. So for example, when a, when a uh, slave was trying to escape, uh, they would go to um, the water because the bloodhounds couldn't smell the scent in the water. And that's where the song, Wade in the Water. Wade in the water, wade in the water, children. So that was a clue. So you can sing, them. I can't sing. So you're you're doing a good job. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, uh, to, to do that. Then another one, uh, there were songs where they would give messages. Uh, so for example, there's one called Follow the Drinking Gourd. Follow mm -hmm. the Drinking Gourd. Well, what is the drinking gourd? It's the big dipper. And where does the big dipper point? To the North to Star. The North Star. So it was a message that if you want to make it to freedom, you follow the drinking gourd to the North Star. Uh, oh. here, here's a, a, a note from Marlene Banks. Yes, and sometimes the spirituals were sung as code for people on the Underground Railroad, just like uh, we're pointing out. And she, uh, she writes, love that book, Nobody Knows. Uh, thank you, Marlene. And uh, when the book first came out, Marlene was very kind to do an interview with me 
uh, on uh, Nobody Knows for her uh, podcast or her uh, website. So that was very, very nice of her. So this is uh, what attracted me to the Burley story. But then as I dug <clears> into <throat> it, I realized that I was on to true American gold as far as history and culture is concerned. So for example, um, my father is a portrait painter. He, he passed away a year ago, but he was a portrait painter. And so anytime we were near a portrait gallery, he would want to go and visit. <clears throat> and so we were in Washington, D.C. together uh, for a Promise Keepers rally. And um, it was a very hot day. And he said, you know, let's go get a drink of water. So we went to get a drink of water. And then he said, you know, uh, <laughs> to cool off, maybe we should walk over to the Smithsonian Portrait Gallery. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, to cool, to cool off. I understand right, right. He had ulterior so, motives. Yeah, so we took a little break and we walked over there. And it, I mean, it was amazing to walk through the portrait gallery. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know what you know special features were there. And as we're walking through, we saw a sign that said, Great African American Leaders, with an arrow pointing into this room. And so we went in there and there were portraits of Martin Luther King Jr., W.E.B., Du Bois, and uh, on and on. And right next to George Washington Carver, there was a portrait of Harry T. Burley, hmm. great African-American leaders, according to the Smithsonian. <clears throat> right. And I turned to my dad because I was working on the thesis, which was the research behind what became this book. And I said, well, dad, if, if Harry Burley is good enough for the Smithsonian, I think I'm on the right track. And so that's how it all began. Awesome. Well, I did find I did think of the movie that I was that I was trying to think of where nobody knows is from. It's sung by a character by the name of Princess Vespa. Do you know what the movie that's from or she's uh, from? I can't think of it. Princess Vespa, the Star Wars spoof Spaceballs. When she's oh, in my prison, <laughs> when she's in prison, she's singing Nobody Knows. Okay, I now I remember. Yes. Right. And so when you said nobody knows and started singing, I was like, I know that from somewhere. So so Harry Burley loved music from the time he was a little boy. And there are two stories from his childhood that demonstrate that love. I was wondering if you could share us with the share with us those stories. Well, both of these stories are in the book Nobody Knows. Mm -hmm. And um the first is that Harry's grandfather was a man named uh, Hamilton Waters, and he was a slave on the eastern shore of Maryland, not too far from Annapolis. And um, someone had given him a, a reader, which helped people to teach themselves how to read, which was illegal in most plantations in the South. They wanted to keep the slaves ignorant so that they could keep them powerless because we all know knowledge is power and power and knowledge comes from reading. And so um, when, when Hamilton was caught with this speller, uh, his foreman beat him with 70 lashes. Uh, they gathered all the slaves from the plantation to watch this, uh, to make an example exactly. of Hamilton and the whip hit him in the <clears throat> eyes and so it caused partial blindness for him. So uh, at that point, he was not of much use to the master. And so the master allowed him to go into town after he was done doing his daily chores and to work among the village uh, for whoever would hire him, sweeping floors or shoveling snow or whatever. And uh, he was able to raise the money to buy his freedom and he also purchased his mother's freedom. His mother's name was Lovey Waters. And so Hamilton purchased their freedom. While he was in town, he fell in love with one of the local girls who was a uh, Scotch Indian young lady named Lucinda. And they fell in love. And so when she found out Hamilton was wanting to go north, she had grown up in the North, up in New York, uh, as a matter of fact, and she had actually worked for a time in the governor's mansion in Albany, New York, as a servant. And so she wanted to go back North because she wanted to see her parents who had moved to Michigan. And so they all moved North, and somewhere along the way, 
they got married. Uh, quite often they would just find an itinerant preacher who was going through town and they would have a quick service and that was it. And so um, at one point, uh, Lucinda uh, got pregnant with Harry Burley's mother. And um, so they stopped in my hometown of Erie, Pennsylvania, which is how I know the story of Harry T. Burley. Um, and they really liked it, but she wanted, Lucinda wanted to go to Michigan to have the baby where her mother was. So they made their way up to Michigan and uh, they had the baby and they looked around and for some reason, we don't know for sure, uh, but they decided not to stay in Michigan. They decided also not to go into Canada. Uh, it could have been because Michigan <laughs> was on the line between Kentucky and Ohio, then Michigan, then up into Canada. And a lot of slaves would who would run away from the South would cross the Ohio River and make their way up into Michigan around Detroit and cross over into Canada for freedom. And so the slave hunters were watching those routes very carefully. Mm. And that could have been why they didn't feel comfortable being in that area. That's what I speculated and put in the book, but we don't know for sure. And so they made their way back to Erie, Pennsylvania, where Hamilton got a job uh, dyeing clothes and laundering and doing that kind of thing. As time went on, he got involved in the Underground Railroad, which had a station in Erie where slaves would come up and they would either cross the lake at Erie or they would go up the shore to Buffalo and cross at Niagara into Canada. Uh, and, and Hamilton actually helped some slaves uh, escape. And that story is in the book as well. But when Hamilton got older, he got a job lighting the gas lamps mm. in downtown Erie. And these were on the pole and they had a little key. You turn the key, the gas would start, and then you had to light the lamp. And then early the next morning, they had to go out and turn all the lamps out. And that was his job. Mm. Well, as he got older, his eyesight got worse and worse. And so he would take either Harry or Harry's brother, Reginald, sometimes he'd take both of them, and they would go out and help him to light the lamps. And so as they were lighting the lamps, Hamilton would teach them the spirituals, the plantation songs, and some of the other folk music that he had learned. And so from a very early age, seven, eight, nine, Harry got music deep down into his soul. Well, Harry also had an amazing voice. And so very early he started singing um, and even making money in his later teen years, uh, doing funerals and weddings and bar mitzvahs and any job that he could get. And so that was one story. Uh, the other story is that uh, Harry's mother um, was able to get a job at the mansion of the uh, one of the bankers in Erie. And it was the Russell Mansion. And the cool thing is, is the Russell Mansion is still there in Erie. Oh, cool. And uh, you can actually go right up to it. It's now a restaurant or something. And at any rate, uh, so his mother, Elizabeth, um, she got a job, you know, working as a servant <clears throat> uh, because the railroad that went from New York City to Chicago goes right through Erie. And so what would happen then, and it still happens today, <clears throat> is that musicians going from New York to Chicago would stop along the way at places like Rochester, Buffalo, Erie, Cleveland, and on up oh, to yeah. Chicago. And so they would go to the Russell Mansion and they would play for the wealthy patrons that were invited by Mrs. Russell. And Elizabeth would be one of the servants in the house. Well, one day the great uh, pianist Josephi was playing at the house and Burley wanted so badly to see to see Josephi play but his mother said no you're you, you're not allowed to do this and Burley was about 10 years old at the time nine or ten somewhere in there and um and so he knew he couldn't go inside so instead he went around to the side of the house it was freezing cold the <clears throat> snow was up to his waist and he stood there in the snow with snow dropping down into his boots. 
and he watched this concert from the inside. Uh, the problem was that he was out there so long, free, freezing and shivering, that he caught uh, pneumonia, oh, wow. and he almost died. And uh, his mother stayed with him and nursed him back to health with the help of the doctor. Uh, and it took him a while to come back to health. And Elizabeth told Mrs. Russell what had happened. And Mrs. Russell was so moved that Harry wanted to hear the musicians that she said, we must make a job for him so that he can come in, he can work the job, but then he can also hear the musicians. And so for the next 10 years, uh, almost for many years at least, Harry uh, was the doorman and he would greet people who came and he'd open <laughs> the door for them. And then when his jobs were, were done, whatever other jobs they had him do, he would be able to go inside and listen to the greatest musicians of the day. And that planted a seed within him that made him desire to become a musician himself. Now he was a great baritone soloist. He knew music very well. He was a very good pianist, but he was an African-American in the, at the height of Jim Crow racism in America. And he tried for many years to get um, a position working full time. He was finally able to travel with a minstrel group. And these groups would sing the spirituals as they went from town to town. Um, but they starved. They hardly mm -hmm. made any money. And after a year of literally starving, he finally gave up and said, well, I guess I'll never be a musician. So he learned how to be a stenographer and he got a job working for a piano company as the stenographer. You know, they didn't have uh, Xerox machines back then. They would copy everything by a stenographer. And so that was Burley's job, but at least he could be close to the music. And the owner of the piano company allowed him to stay afterwards and to practice. And so that's what he did just to keep going with it uh, until one fateful day. And we'll tell about that in a moment. Uh, uh, as you were talking, going back to Hamilton Waters, as you were doing research for the book, you um, you came across his Hamilton's obituary at the Erie Historical Society. So how did you use that obituary that you found in your book? Well, it was only about two or three, probably three inches long, one column. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't that long, but it, you know, I had to wear the uh, cloth gloves because it was a newspaper from the 1870s. Wow. wow. And so you have to be very careful with, with them. And so I'm looking through these, through all the Burley papers at the Erie County Historical Society. And I came across this and I was like, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. And I'm paraphrasing, but basically it had his last words oh, in wow. that little obituary. And it basically said, um, there's a ship coming for to get me and it's going to come soon. So I've got my trunk packed and ready because I sense the ship coming around the curve. Imagine hmm. that was his last, those were Hamilton's huh. last words. And so Obviously, I was not there when Hamilton died. Obviously, the, uh, Obviously. no one knows what was said. And um, all nobody I could do... Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And all I could do was build a death scene uh, based on this one little obituary. And that's what I did. So, um, you know, nobody knows. While it's based on a true story and it's as real as I know it can be, there are scenes where I had to create dialogue, where I had to create scenes. And so it is historical fiction, but it's also narrative nonfiction. It walks the fence between those two genres. And so um, that was used in, in Hamilton's death scene with Harry there uh, with him when he died. And then it is reused in Harry's death scene, which I will read at the end of our time together. Oh, wow. I did not know that treat. I'm excited about that. <laughs> so um, if you could you tell me, tell us the story of how Harry was able to become a student at the New York Conservatory? Well, that is where I left off with the story right. of him playing the piano. One day he was working 
at the piano company and Elizabeth, his mother, came bounding through the door uh, and it scared Harry at first because he thought something bad has happened. And uh, he went and she took him over to the corner of the of the building and she uh, had a magazine with her. And she said, Harry, I've got some very good news. And she opened it up to the classifieds. And this, this was a musical magazine that she got at Mrs. Russell's house because Mrs. Russell was a big patron of music. So she'd get all these musical magazines and then she'd let the servants read them when she was done. And so she was reading this uh, magazine and um, there was an ad talking about uh, a, a possible uh, scholarship at the National Conservatory of Music in New York City. And she mm. said, this could be your opportunity, Harry. And Harry said, I have no money. How could I get to New York City? I, I don't know how I could do it. She said, I don't know how you're going to do it, but God knows how you're going to do it. And we'll find a way. And so the Erie community all started. And I actually saw in the historical records, the records of people who gave and contributed uh, donations and the local bank set up a fund where people could go into the bank and make donations for Harry T. Burley's trip to New York to do the scholarship, which I think is That's just awesome. a wonderful thing. That is Marlene amazing. writes uh, faction. She said here, fiction mixed with historical facts. And that's, that's it. Although I tried to make it as much historical facts as I could. And then I filled in the, the fiction where the I needed dialogue. it. The dialogue yeah. uh yeah. to tell a narrative because it's a, a narrative book it's not a biography like victor victor is an actual biography this is a historical fiction narrative non-fiction biography so it's kind of a blend right. so anyway they wrote raised this money and harry was able to borrow a suit and he packed his bags and got on a train and went to New York City, and it was terribly hot the day that he auditioned. Uh, now, the National Conservatory of Music was the forerunner to what we now know as Juilliard. Uh, it, it had gone through its life and death, and then Juilliard raised up not long after the conservatory uh, closed. But it, the conservatory kind of paved the way for Juilliard. And so... Uh, you know, some of the greatest musicians of the time went through the National Conservatory and were trained there. And the whole idea was at that time, a lot of people traveled to Europe for their training and then came back to America. And a lot of people thought that America by this point is now 100 plus years old. It should have its own universities and its <laughs> own conservatories, and it should start developing its own music. And so uh, Burley uh, had his opportunity to do an audition, but the problem was the collar was too tight and it was so hot that he was parched and he was so nervous that he kind of botched the audition. Oh, wow. And he knew it. He knew that he didn't, he didn't get it. And on that level, you have to be perfect to get, an, uh, to get a scholarship. And he was yeah. not perfect. Well, before he left Erie, his mother gave him a letter of recommendation from none other than Mrs. Russell, because Mrs. Russell knew the registrar, Mrs. McDowell, of the National Conservatory. And she said, make sure Harry gives this letter to Mrs. McDowell, because Mrs. McDowell used to travel with the different musicians and stop at Mrs. Russell's house oh, uh, wow. with those musicians. Right, right. So there was a connection here. Well, Burley so was so flustered that he left uh, without giving the letter to Mrs. McDowell. But before he left, she said, you have to come back tomorrow at 10 or whatever time to get your score. And Burley's like, I'll be back. But he knew he didn't make it. And so he went out and he just wept. And he thought about joining a minstrel company. You know, back then it was the blackface, which was very derogatory uh, it was the worst stereotypes of African Americans, uh, making fun of them, making <clears throat> them out to be uh, very negative caricatures of themselves, uh, very derogatory. And so 
His mother had told him, Harry, no matter what happens, don't go to the minstrels. But now he thought he was not going to get the scholarship. And the right. only way he could break into music was to put on the blackface and be in a minstrel show. And so he very seriously thought about doing it. So the next morning he got up and was getting ready. He was at a hotel and he was getting ready to go back to get his score. And he was depressed and it was blazing hot again. This time he didn't wear that tight suit. He, he just went in a comfortable outfit. But as he was walking out of his hotel, he noticed the, the letter that he had forgotten the day before. And he thought, well, I don't know what it says, but <clears throat> I need to deliver this because I said I would. And so he took the letter in and Mrs. McDowell greeted him and said, well, I'm sorry, you got an ABA and you needed an AAA in order to get the scholarship. So I, I'm sorry. And Harry turned to leave, but then he remembered the letter and he turned back and he said, oh, um, you may remember Mrs. Russell from Erie, Pennsylvania. She's my former employer and my mother works for her. She wrote this letter to you and asked me to give it to you. And she was delighted. Oh, that's lovely. She opened it up and it's a letter of recommendation reminding her that she had seen Harry as the footman, the man opening the door at the house. And Mrs. Russell said, you're that, I remember you. You were the one who opened the door when we arrived, right? He said, yes, ma'am, I remember you as well. She said, this is remarkable. She said, well, this changes everything. She said, you wait right there, I'll be right back. And she ran in and talked to the powers that be and convinced them to give Harry another try. And wow. so I don't know if it was that day or the next day, but Harry got a second audition. This time he nailed it. It was perfect. They saw how great a musician, how great a singer he was. And Harry received a scholarship to the New World Symphony. Now, that was just for the um, for the tuition. He still needed to do, uh, he still needed to make money for room and board. And so they offered him a, a job as a janitor, cleaning and mopping the floors. I know it was shocking. I mean, it was it shook his world really. My phone just fell. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, so he got that job, and uh, he used to sing the spirituals and the plantation songs as he'd be, you know, I, after everyone had gone home at night, he'd be out there mopping the halls and singing these songs, and that led to another breakthrough in his life, which we'll get to in a moment. Awesome. So how did Harry T. Burley influence Antonin Dvor Dvorak? Did I say Dvorak. That right? Dvorak. I know I mispronounced it. In the <laughs> writing of the New World Symphony. You just mentioned the New World Symphony. Well, that is that was the moment. So what happened is Antonin Dvorak was a great, very, um, uh, a very respected composer in Europe by this time. And Marlene writes in the divine providence of God. Amen. Yes. And so um, the head of the conservatory was an, a woman named Jeanette Thurber. And her mother, her husband was a very wealthy uh, merchant. And he had a, he was one of the first people to ever have a chain of grocery stores that went like throughout New, uh, New York and New England. And so they were full of money. And so uh, Jeanette was the one who started the conservatory and she wanted to have the greatest musicians, not only as professors, but also as uh, the president. And so she met Dvorak in Europe and she told him that she wanted him to come to America because she thought that the things that he had done in taking folk music in Europe and turning it into classical music, she said, that's what we need in America. We've got folk, folk music. We now need to elevate it to classical music. Well, Ber um, mm -hmm. Dvorak had been the son of an innkeeper. And so he grew up hearing all the umpa drinking songs, you know, you know, all that Germanic. How'd that go? How'd that go? <laughs> You, All make that an album. Organic, you know, the type of thing you see in a Disney movie, you know, uh, you know, oh, what a guy, Gaston, right? Anyway, um, so he grew up hearing all these songs 
And but he had a, a wonderful musical gift, and he was brought under the wing of Brahms. And Brahms uh, encouraged him to take those folk songs and make classical arrangements to them. So that's where we get the Slavonic dances and some of the other great uh, pieces that Dvorak did in Europe. And so Jeanette Thurber said, come to America and teach our people to do the same thing. So that was uh, his goal. Uh, Dvorak had seen the uh, Fisk Jubilee Singers, which was a singing group from Fisk College, which is now Fisk University. And they traveled around America and then around the world, raising money by singing the spirituals. And Dvorak had seen them in Prague and said, oh, this is wonderful. And then he had seen some Native American uh, Indians who were uh, singing and doing their music. And he found that amazing. He heard some of the Highlands music uh, from Appalachia. And he thought, oh, I can't wait to get to America and dig into all of this folk music. And so he took the job. Cool. And so on that fateful night, there's Harry T. Burley, who had learned all the spirituals and all the plantation songs and the folk songs from his grandfather. And he's out there, you know, uh, doing, you know, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, 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 as he's mopping. And all of a sudden, from behind the door comes this huge voice. What is this music? What is this music? <laughs> and it's Dvorak, the president of the conservatory. And he comes bounding out. And Bur Burley is hes totally panicked because he thought he was disturbing him. He didn't know he was there. He th and he said, I'm so sorry, Dr. Dvorak. If I knew you were there, I would have kept quiet. And Dvorak's like, quiet? No, no. I want to hear everything that you know. This is why I came to America. I want you to sing everything you know for me. <coughs> Excuse me. And so for the next nine months, Dvorak took Burley under his wing and Burley sang every spiritual, every plantation song, every work song or folk song that he knew to Dvorak. Dvorak also was listening to the Native American stuff. He was also listening to the Highlands music and he was drinking all of these themes in and mixing them in his genius head and he started writing bit by bit piece by piece and he would give them to Burley because Burley was a stenographer mm -hmm. and so he'd take these scribbled notes and give them to Burley and Burley would uh, create clean copy for him and so after a while Burley's like this is genius whatever it is that he's writing is amazing Right. So one night he asked him, you know, Dr. Dvorak, what is it that you're doing? And Dvorak said, I've taken what you've sung for me and the Native American music and the Highlands music, and I'm melding it with classical to create a symphony from the new world, which we now know and, and many people around the world love and cherish Symphony Number no. 9 by Dvorak, which he and he nicknamed from the New World or the New World Symphony. And so when it was just about finished, Dvorak played the second movement, which is called the Largo movement. And that is, people will recognize it. Da, 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 da. You hear it in movies, TV shows, com commercials. Yeah, well, yeah. It was written in the 18, mid 1890s by Antonin Dvorak, and it's still being used all over the world. Later on, one of Dvorak's students, not Burley, but another one, put lyrics to that music, that second movement, and it is the song, Going Home. Going home, going home, I'm a going home, which is a hauntingly beautiful song that was played at Franklin Delano Roosevelt's funeral, oh, wow. among many other places. Uh, it is just one of the great songs in American history, which was the music was written by a, uh, a Bohemian, uh, Antonin Dvorak. And Dvorak played that for Burley and said, Harry, when, when I heard your voice and heard the story of your grandfather, it made me think of this. And I wrote this uh, motivated by your voice and by your grandfather's story. 
And so uh, Dvorak made it very clear in Musical America magazine. He said, I was influenced <laughs> by one of my students who sang for me for months. And that was Harry T. Burley. Awesome. Well, so could you please tell us the relationship between Burley and another important figure in American history, J.P. Morgan? Yes, this is the J.P. Morgan of which mm -hmm. we get J.P. Morgan Bank right. and investments and all the rest. He was a um, he was a tough businessman, but he was a very committed family man and a very committed Christian. And he was an elder at St. George's Episcopal Cathedral. J.P. Morgan is who I'm talking about here. And so what happened is as Burley was approaching graduation, an opening uh, came at St. George's Episcopal Church, which is this beautiful, huge cathedral in Manhattan. Uh, right on Stuyvesant Square, if you're familiar. Right now, it's right across from um, oh, the Jewish Hospital, which I can't think of. Beth Israel, I think, Hospital in, in Manhattan. Right, okay. not far from uh, from the Wall Street District. And yeah. so uh, Morgan was the uh, one of the elders there. And so when uh, Jeanette Thurber got word that there was an opening, she went directly to Harry T. Burley and said. Uh, you need to audition for this opening. And Burley kind of laughed in her face and said, this is the this is the home of the Knickerbockers, the home of the J.P. Morgans and many of the very wealthy white people of Manhattan. And there are no black people. There are no <laughs> Hispanic people. This is a big, white, rich church. And you want me right. to audition? I don't think this is such a good idea. <clears throat> well, uh, Jeanette Thurber that got her goat. Uh, and she was like, Harry, why do you think we had the scholarship? We had the scholarship and we brought in people like you, people of color, to break down these barriers. We trained you so that you would take your God-given talent and mix it with this training and go in there and win scholarship or win positions like this so that it's no longer just a white church. It's all God's children's church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, that kind of made Burley feel a little sheepish. And so he said, well, ma'am, uh, I, I didn't really look at it that way. And so since you say it that way, I'll go and do it. But he was terribly, um, you know, scared about doing this. And sure enough, on the day of the audition, I don't know how many people there, uh, 30 to 50 people. I don't remember. It's in mm -hmm. the book. But um He's the only black person who auditioned, the only one. And so when it was his turn, there was the uh, choir director, the pastor, and J.P. Morgan were the judges. And oh, wow. so they had to go up and sing in front of these people. And uh, so Burley sang, and uh, it was said that within 15 seconds or 20 seconds, J.P. Morgan turned to the other two and said, that's my man. He so loved Burley's voice that he knew immediately. And they gave Burley the job, wow. which was terribly intimidating, but also an amazing honor for Burley. And so Burley was a trailblazer. He broke down this barrier. But on that first Sunday, uh, when Burley's turn, when it was his turn to sing, he stepped forward to do his part. And more than half of the church got up and walked out in protest. Yeah. You know, we, a lot of people say, Oh, that Jim Crow and that racism, that was just in the South. Uh, no, it was, it was everywhere. everywhere and it is everywhere to a certain degree. Uh, that is why I wrote a book like this to help uh, educate people as to what the real situation is and help people see, maybe take a look at their own heart and say, well, where am I? What is it? Is there a place where I am harboring uh, racism? Is there a place where I'm harboring pre prejudice or an ungodly, unchristian, unchristlike attitude? And um, so, you know, here it is, a an Episcopal Christian church, and they had half the church watch, walk out. Very Christ-like, right? Right. Not really. And so Burley was felt just terrible about this. And he went to the pastor and to choir director, and he said, I, I didn't come here to split your church. 
Um, I think I should just uh, resign. And uh, when JP Morgan heard about it, he came rushing in and he said, there is no way that you're going to resign. You are the right person. And we don't care if those people stay away. <clears throat> We're going to keep moving forward. And so everybody agreed, the pastor or rector, as they call them in the Episcopal Church, and the choir director and J.P. Morgan all agreed. And so Burley stayed. And the next Sunday, almost everyone was back, uh, only just a handful. And eventually that church fell in love with the gentleman and the great singer and musician, Harry T. Burley. And in the end, Burley ended up changing that church forever. Eventually, they adopted a yearly uh, service of the spirituals that was so popular that the church was filled to the, to the doors. So then they put speakers out in Stuyvesant Square, and then that was filled. And so then uh, CBS and NBC Radio started carrying it, and it went all across the nation. Wow. And by the, by the time Burley retired 52 years later, that was an integrated church, and it's an integrated church to this day. That's awesome. That's a that's a cool story. So, um, what did musicologist Dominique René de de Lerma, de Lerma say of Burley and American music? And did I say the name right? Close enough. <laughs> we'll let it go on that. It's it's de Lerma, but but that's I said fine. de Lerma, didn't I? You did. It took you a while, but you got there. I stumbled over it, but I got to it. So. <laughs> That's all right. Um, during my research for this book, I came across an interview of uh, Dominic uh, René DeLerma on National Public Radio. And he was talking about the, uh, the birth of American music, and he made this quote. And, you know, again, I told you about how the Smithsonian had a portrait of Burley hanging in the Smithsonian Portrait Gallery uh, amongst the great African-American leaders. Well, this was another one of those shots in the arm to tell me that I was on the right track in pursuing this story because DeLerma said that because of Burley's background, his grandfather was African-American, his grandmother, Lucinda, was Scotch and Native American. So you had the African-American folk songs, the, the Negro spirituals, you had the Highlands, Appalachian music, and then you had the Native American music. All of those were in Burley's blood. And That's he awesome. learned all of that different type of music growing up. But then Burley went to and won the scholarship to Juilliard. So he was trained in all the theory of classical music. And there were musicians like uh, Rosamond Johnson and his brother, uh, his brother was an ambassador under Teddy Roosevelt, but he was also a great musician. And they said, along with Bob Cole and Will Marion, uh, uh, or Will Marion Cook, these were great musicians of their days, all African-American musicians. And they said, whenever we had a disagreement about the theory of music, we would go to Burley and whatever Burley said, we all agreed that's the answer. That's what a great musician he was. And so DeLerma said that in Harry T. Burley, you had the birth of American music because wow. from that seedbed of Burley and his contemporaries. So it wasn't just Burley, but Burley kind of embodies all of it. Mm -hmm. But you had the growth of jazz, gospel, the blues, uh, the different church music, art music, theater <clears throat> music. And then from that down the road, you had Boogie Woogie, and then you had rock and roll. And so what became American music grew out of the seedbed of the 1890s, which, in, which uh, grew out of the earlier folk music. But it was Dvorak who brought that idea to America, taught his students, and Harry Burley, Will Marion Cook, Bob Cole, the Roseman brothers, or the Johnson brothers, and others of that era, they were the ones to really push it forward. And so <clears throat> Bob Cole and the, and the uh, Johnson brothers and, and uh, Will Marion Cook, they were doing African-American Broadway music like Clorindy and the, the, uh, the, uh, the myth of the cakewalk 
which was a huge Broadway hit. Well, those were all precursors to what the Gershwins did a generation later in writing Porgy and Bess, which we now know Porgy and Bess. But Porgy and Bess was influenced by Burley's generation. Oh, wow. People that wow. we know, like uh, Louis Armstrong or Paul Robeson, uh, John McCormick and uh, Seagal, and that whole generation that we know because of radio and phonograph records and later movies. All of those people were taught by Burley's generation. So That's no, cool. again, nobody knows Burley, but we know, you know, like Marian Anderson. We know his Burley. impact. We know his impact. So Marian yeah. Anderson was one of Burley's protege, or uh, he was her her teacher and uh, a mentor to her. Well, Marian Anderson was the one uh, when um, when they wouldn't allow African American singers at. Uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt's inauguration, uh, you know, Mrs. Roosevelt reached out to Marian Anderson and they set up a concert, a prote protest concert. Eleanor Roosevelt set this up on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and Marian Anderson sang for a crowd of, I think it was 100,000 people that were gathered there. It was on the radio and it was basically thumbing their noses at these uh, racists who wouldn't allow uh, African-Americans to sing at, at FDR's inauguration. And Marion wow. Anderson was one of Burley's students. That's cool. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a little tickle. Oh, no worries. So what, uh, this book isn't the only thing that you've done with about Harry T. Burley. You're, you're working on some other Burley-related projects. And so I was wondering if you could go into – a little about what those what those are and kind of the progress you've made so far on those other burly related projects. <laughs> well, I I don't want to give too much away. Okay. Um, we want to keep people in suspense. But this book uh, came out in 2014, and it went out of print about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I am in the process of doing an update to this book. It will have just a little bit of new information. Uh, not much. It'll still be pretty much the same story, but a new cover, and um, it'll probably still be called Nobody Knows, but that will be de determined by the publisher. But it is with uh, being considered by a publisher right now that will remain nameless, but it looks uh, promising. And so a new version of Nobody Knows should be coming out uh, possibly by middle of next year, uh, maybe even a little bit before then. Uh, so keep your eyes open for a new version, an updated version of Nobody Knows. Also, I have adapted uh, the book into a couple of other, uh, well, one other right now and possibly another down the road, another type of genre. And we're not going to tell what that genre <laughs> is right now, but it is something that will be very accessible to the public and those who are interested in this moving and inspiring story, uh, it will be something that we'll be able to uh, keep the uh, memory of this great African-American hero, musician, role model alive uh, for hopefully generations to come. And uh, hopefully he'll be restored to his rightful place in American history. And we will no longer have to say, Harry T. Who? Uh, nobody knows him. We're not gonna be, we're not gonna have to say that anymore. So while I was doing the research for this, um, you know, I do deep dives when I'm working on a project. I read everything I can read about that person. I watch every movie. I listen to the music. So I had so engulfed myself in that world, you know, from the 1880s through the 1930s, which was basically the arc of his career, um, you know, that I that was all I was listening to for the most part. And so at one point, my son, uh, who was about six years old at the time, he came up uh, to, to me and uh, he said, uh, Daddy, how long will Harry T. Burley be living with us? <laughs> 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 and, uh, and I told him, well, maybe for the rest of our lives. <laughs> and here he is. He's still here. He's still here, David. <laughs> and um, right around the same time, um, I had learned about Burley's favorite restaurant or one of his favorite restaurants, which was the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Station. 
If you go to Grand Central Station downstairs under that great big hall where all the light shines in, right, yeah. just below there, there are the doorways to all the train tracks. And there are restaurants and shops and shoe shine people down there and all that kind of thing. And it's really wonderful because it's upheld by these grand pillars right. um, down underneath. Well, one of the restaurants down there is Burley's favorite restaurant, which was called the Oyster Bar of Grand Central Station. It still exists to this day. Oh, wow. And uh, years later, my daughter and I went to see Wicked on Broadway. And that day, earlier that day, we went to dinner at the Grand Central, uh, at the Oyster Bar at Grand Central. But before any of that, years before, while I was working on this, um, I had a dream and I had never seen pictures of the, of the restaurant, but I dreamt that I was in this restaurant and an African-American waiter came up to uh, take my order. And, you know, he had on a, like a tux and he had the, the white towel over his arm and he leaned in and I looked up and it was Harry T. Burley. And he said to me, thank you for remembering. That's cool. In my dream. That's and it was so real. You know, there are times where I wonder if God doesn't allow a little bit of communication between heaven and earth. You know, the Bible in Hebrew says that there's a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering on the believers to finish the race. And you know, I've heard so many stories of people who have had those kind of dreams or visions that it makes me wonder if every once in a while the Lord doesn't allow those kind of a thing, those kind of things just to keep us going and to uh, to keep us encouraged. And right, uh, absolutely. Marlene says, oh, wow, how prophetic. <laughs> and it really was. That's so cool. I uh, there are copies, even new copies of Nobody Knows available on Amazon.com. If you want to buy one now and not wait for the new uh, version, but the new version hopefully will be coming out in 2022. So we encourage you to check that out. Uh, you can also check out my other books on Amazon.com, or you could get the uh, Victor book at uh, GrantVictorBook.com, or the Forward book at GrantForwardBook.com, or go to my website VonBuzik.com, and all of my books are there. And John C. Farrell, your book is available on, on Amazon. And what is the name of that book again? The official NASCAR trivia book by by John C. Farrell with John an C. Farrell with an introduction by Marty Smith, who is a very popular ESPN um, broadcaster, sports. Very caster. nice. So it says with a thousand and one facts and questions to test your racing knowledge. Absolutely. So any final no. thoughts before we break? No, um, I was excited to hear about a a guy that has impacted American music uh, a lot more than I ever knew and uh, something that you still see effects of his of his brilliance today and I do have a quick question for you can his music be heard or found on YouTube like actually I there is one song that I know of um, it is go down Moses where you oh. hear him singing it's a recording towards the end of his career. So his voice is not as strong as it had been, but it's still, it's still Harry Burley. And then also there's a recording by John McCormack, the great Irish tenor singing Burley's hit that he wrote because Burley, in addition to writing uh, artistic arrangements of the spirituals and making them known to the world, Burley also wrote his own music, which was extremely popular wow. during the height of his career. And one of his biggest hits was called Little Mother of Mine. And so look up John McCormack, Little Mother of Mine, and you actually hear that 1920s, you know, really screechy kind of thing, but it's really cool. Uh, cool. You know, and it's very much a product of its time. Just like you know a song from the 50s or 60s or 70s, you know that this is a song from the 20s, but it's delightful. And then, of course, hearing Burley sing is, is a real treat as well. Cool. I, that's all I have to say. And any closing remarks, Mr. Von Busek? No, I think Dr. that's about it. So watch for Nobody Knows in 2022. And also we'll be making announcements as things get closer 
to the time uh, when we are making an announcement about the other project, which is actually coming along very well. I'm actually waiting for John C. Farrell to uh, give me his feedback on that other project. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm waiting, I'm patiently waiting, and someday my ship will come in. You need to remind me. Like, I just did. <laughs> yeah, well, send me a text and say, so, hey, so, review so John this. C. Farrell knows what this project is. Yes. And so at any I rate, dropped we, the ball extremely. Yes. Uh, hopefully he'll have it to me by the next program. That's the goal. By next program, you could say, I have done my assignment and it's in your inbox. Get off my back. <laughs> All right. So for John C. Farrell, this is Craig Von Buzik. We're here every week. At this same time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time here in the United States for Stories and Myths. So we will see you again next week. Same bad time, same, same bad, bad channel. channel. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.